Uh, talking to B. Wilson uh, will be Catherine Cleary, who's a journalist, an author, and a broadcaster. She began her career as a reporter with the Irish Times in 1994, and later she became security correspondent of the Sunday Tribune, another of Vincent's uh, ventures. Catherine's publications include Life Sentence, Murder Victims and Their Families, published in 2004, and uh, A Month of Sundays, A Month of Some Days, um, How One Woman uh, Makes the Most of Now, which is 20. 12. And she wrote with Alice Leahy, who some of you might remember was here with us last year, uh, one of Ireland's most fearless advocates for the homeless and a truly wonderful woman. She and Catherine together produced The Stars Are Our Only Warmth, uh, published in 2018, which is a sort of autobiography in a way of Alice, but also a book packed full of policy ideas for dealing with homelessness. She co-wrote Counterculture, The Sheraton's Guide to Cheese, what, what better people to be given as a guide to cheese in 2015. And she also co-wrote and presented the RTE radio series History on a Plate with historian uh, Juliana Adelman. She's been writing the weekly, uh, essential weekly uh, restaurant column in the Irish Times for many years. So please welcome Catherine Cleary and B. Wilson. Thank you, Katrina. Um, it's not my first time in Goy, but it is my first time in Goy without a coat, I think. So it's great to be here. And thank you so much. I think this is called First Thought. And my first thought when Katrina sent me the email asking would I come to Goy to interview B was, yippee, I have been such a huge fan of this woman for years and uh, just um, in awe of her ability to write about a subject that we all think about and we, we all eat, we all obsess about it in some way, we, you know, we photograph things, we, but actually to write about it in a way that just shines this amazing light on the complexity of it. She is the voice that we need in these days um, where there are so many interests and uh, forces at work with uh, getting what it is that we find in our supermarkets onto those shelves. She is a voice of somebody who it has a very clear eye uh, for what matters um, and what she loves. Uh, she's somebody who loves food and writes very lovingly about food, um, but also very clearly uh, takes the temperature of where we are now and that sort of feeling that everything's going so fast. I think as a historian as well, she also has a long view of how uh, extraordinary this age that we are in now is compared to not so very recent or not so very long ago, uh, long past history. Um, so the, the book we might focus on today is her latest book, which is The Way We Eat Now. Um, I'd encourage everybody in the audience to read it because, like I say, it's, it's probably the most ambitious uh, book of her, of her career. I, I feel um, it takes not just uh, you know, the idea of what she's eating in her own family circumstances, but and then widens it out to the rest of the world, you know, to Korean um, crazy YouTube videos, to American <coughs> university professors who are looking, uh, you know, have made it their life's work to try and figure out why we are eating the way we're eating now and where it means that we are going to. Um, so I just wanted to start with a question to be about uh, the process, really, as a, as a writer or a journalist, how do you take that really wide, you know, incredibly complex world that we are? And, and I mean, where do you start? What, where did this book start? What, what was the idea or the question in your head that it started with? It started somewhere completely different from where it ended up. <laughs> but I mean, you write nonfiction as well, so you understand that. Like, it, the process of the structure, I mean, I, I'm sure a novelist would say that the structure is everything as well. But I often find that the structure of a book completely changes from the proposal to the end result. So this Does that make it a more interesting book for you, do you? I hope so. I mean, the, the problem, I think, with writing, and this probably is definitely common to fiction writers and non-fiction writers, is that we all have sort of fragile egos and we're constantly thinking that what we're doing is terrible. And the thing with the book I find is there's this amazing book out there in your imagination and it never quite makes it onto the page. And with a subject like this, where, as you say, I was trying to do the whole gamut yeah. when I summarise it. I think this may be on the jacket. I sometimes say it's the good, the bad, the avocado toast. Uh -huh. um, and, I, and I am trying to write about those funny little trends and the small things that have changed in our lives as well. But it's, it's nothing it, worse than co-faced writing about food. Exactly, it? and it yeah. can get so serious. Yeah. And actually, as you said, it, it's joy, it's pleasure. And 
So it began smaller. I began thinking about this book as a kind of kitchen census. I'm a very nosy person, and actually, I don't... I was going to say, when I shop in the supermarket, I don't physically go around the supermarket that much. I would rather do as much of my shopping as I can from things like organic veg boxes and then do an online shop. And Yeah, that's another part of the story, isn't it? But days when I have been around a big supermarket and somebody leaves a shopping list behind... And you think, who is this person? <laughs> who lives a house like yes, this? Who? Exactly. Yeah. So I feel that was my vision almost. I almost wanted to know, how are people actually shopping behind closed doors? I you think my snoop. vision for it was a kind of snoop snoop taking a kitchen census almost. Yeah. But the more I began to kind of explore it and think about, I hadn't realised what a global story it was. I kind of thought, this is Britain, this is America, this is Ireland, this is Australia, countries like that. Yeah. And then I went to Mumbai, and people there were telling me the same story. Yeah. And then I went to Nanjing, and it seemed the same thing, but happening much, much, much faster. You it's know. the baby shark. We were just talking about this baby shark. If you mm. go around anywhere in the world, it's this international language. And similarly, there's a globalised... Similarly with food. food you go into idea. Starbucks in Nanjing, and they've got the same cakes that I could have found in London or Cambridge, or I don't know if there is a Starbucks in Galway. I guess there is. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. I think, I think so. Yeah. 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 Um, <laughs> and uh, so it, it widened and it became bigger and it therefore became much more impossible to structure. And there were moments where I was just surrounded, as my family at the back could confirm, with kind of post-it notes and bits of paper and thinking, where on earth does this go? Because every single thing could have gone in every single chapter. Yeah. So there's a point where you're just sifting stuff out and artificially almost saying, this goes in this chapter here, which I am saying is about time. Uh -huh. I have a chapter on time, which also encompasses snacking, because I feel we wouldn't snack so much if we didn't feel pressed for time. But the snacking equally could have gone in this other chapter, which is about the nutrition transition. I mean, everything could have gone everywhere. It's a so whole a big reasons. mess. Yeah. <laughs> um, and I was trying to carve through it with... I have never had so many colour-coding systems. And then at one point, I just did not have enough highlighter pens. Brilliant. <laughs> start and then, again. Did you have another? This whole did purple. You have, oh. <laughs> <laughs> I never heard of a purple yes, highlighter. That's they're quite cool. rare. You need to go so to the neon yellow, shop. pink, and purple. Excellent, mm. excellent. And did you then have an editor coming in and saying, "Actually, be no, we need to put that in the snacky set," or had you yes. done that? You know, and I'm was really that lucky. I have two editors. My last two books have both been edited simultaneously in the states and in the UK. And I have two very opinionated female editors, but who are opinionated about different things. Mm -hmm. And sometimes when you're in the middle of that process, you're thinking, I just can't have these people. It's like I'm a, um, my parents got divorced when I was 14, and at moments I was just thinking, I'm in the middle of it again. <laughs> They're all <arguing. laughs> you're fighting. Yes. <laughs> Please just be nice to each other. But I, when you come out the other side, you think, I'm really glad to have had those critical voices, because food is one of those subjects that brings out... Emotion. The divorce lawyer and all yeah. of us. I mean, it's, yeah. it's something quite... Um, it's visceral. We have strong feelings. Yeah. We're touchy about it. You yeah. can easily push the wrong buttons yeah. without meaning to. Yeah. And you know, we, we had a lunch earlier and, and we ended up having a kind of five-minute talk about Ready Breck, which I had no idea that I had any feelings about Ready Breck, but it turns out I do. It turns you know? out we both have quite strong <laughs> nostalgic feelings yeah. about Ready Breck. And the, and the ad with the glow around the children. Mm. But I just want to read... Um, one of my favourite quotes ever about food um, from this book, where B writes about, and it goes back to that idea of uh, the ability to eat the same food anywhere in the world, which is either this amazing modern miracle of access to deliciousness or a catastrophe or both. Or, you know, so, but she writes about um, only in modern times, Wilson writes in one of her many, many brilliant passages. <laughs> Could a person buy a stackable carton of fried crisps made from a slurry of dried potatoes and wheat starch, seasoned with barbecue flavouring, and sit on a sofa eating them, not for celebration, not even out of hunger, but just out of a mild feeling of restless boredom? Only in stage four, and I'm going to ask her about these stages in a minute, could uh, another person in the same mildly bored state be eating exactly the same crisps at 
the exact same moment on another sofa somewhere halfway across the world. So I think Pringles really need to put a stackable carton of fried crisps made from a slurry of dried potatoes on the sides <laughs> of their packaging, because I think that would, you know, that would definitely That would tell us what more. was inside. So what, what does stage four mean? Mm. Um, and where, what are those stages? Mm. Um, so, so part of how the book changed is that I came across an amazing man called Barry Popkin. So all of my books, I'm a just journalist, really, gathering together lots of secondary literature, and I'm very much drawing on the wisdom and research of others. And for this book, I mean, there were some amazing people I interviewed, not just him, but the person that I kept coming back to was this man called Barry Popkin, who's a professor of nutrition in Chapel Hill, um, North Carolina, in the States, and he seems to have researched every subject about modern food you can think of. He's the leading expert on snacking habits in modern China, for example. He's been measuring how the Chinese eat since, I think, the year 1999. And he discovered, you know, it, this is an exaggeration, but he discovered no one snacked in China until the year 2004. Wow. Then they start snacking. Wow. In 2004, snacking is healthy. They eat fruit. Then two years later, the big food companies come in, and as he put it to me, boom, 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 the snacking isn't healthy anymore. So he's somebody that, he's got this huge brain, limitless powers of energy, and just goes around the world trying to measure what people are actually eating. And the central concept in the book comes from him. So stage four that you mentioned, he has this idea, the nutrition transition. So if you try to make sense of this bewildering world we're all living and eating in, which is in some ways wonderful, because... The huge underpinning thing behind the book, which I'm not taking for granted, is that most of us, still not everyone, but most of us are not living with the spectre of hunger anymore. And that's incredible. And that's the happy story we've been told about food so many times, rightly so, that, you know, 1947, half of all people on the planet chronically undernourished. Now it's one in nine, even though the population has gone hugely up. So that's amazing. That's part of the nutrition transition. But it also goes along with these changes where you suddenly have these diet-related diseases that didn't used to exist in the past. You have children developing type 2 diabetes. You have infant tooth decay. You have obesity. You have metabolic syndrome. And what Barry Popkin says is that if you look at human history, every single stage of human history is, in some sense, also a stage of diet. So you can go back, you know, people that profess the paleo diet say, let's go all the way back to hunter-gatherers. And they've kind of got a point in that what we know about hunter-gatherers, incredibly healthy, whether any of us would actually like to live like a hunter-gatherer. It takes a long time, a lot of chunkier day. Yes, you know, <laughs> yes. and I think it was, you know, as so often, it was the women gathering yeah. that often bore the brunt. You know, the men went out for the nice celebration bits of meat and came back with those, but the task of gathering and keeping a fire going, it was hard work. However, we know that the hunter-gatherers communities that are alive today, incredibly healthy gut microbiome, diverse, if there was enough food, wonderful diversity of nuts and berries and wild game, you are also living this precarious, dangerous existence, mm -hmm. which very few modern human beings mm -hmm. would choose to go back to. So that's, so phase one, hunter-gatherer. Phase two, farming. So you go back 10 to 20,000 years, depending on where in the world you live. You suddenly get farming. You get the Neolithic era. Farming changes everything. I would not want to go back to an era before farming. I think farmers are great. I think part of what's gone wrong now is that we're living so far from the soil that we're even forgetting where our food comes from. So that's phase two. Um, and it goes along with a host of other changes. You know, the whole of human civilization is really founded on phase two. And people can stay in one place. That's people can stay in one place. They can settle. They don't have to spend... In hunter-gatherer communities, the act of gathering or hunting food is what dominates everyone's day. Mm -hmm. Suddenly, with farming, some people over here create these massive surpluses of grain, mm -hmm. which means that other people can go off and do other jobs um, and make things and build things and think and write and do all and of these other phones, things. Something. Exactly. <laughs> Be here at the Galway Festival. It, 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 all of that happened because of farming. Phase three, um, which there is no golden age, that's the other thing, but phase three sounds a little bit like a golden age compared like, to where we are now. I'd like a golden age. <laughs> I'd like a golden age, but there isn't one. But phase yeah. three is what he calls receding famine. So you have farming but you have improvements to farming, you have crop rotation, you have new technologies, you have new cooking techniques. 
you have people discovering different ways to pickle and ferment and preserve. And that goes on for, you know, depending where in the world you are, for you know, many hundreds of years. But then suddenly you get stage four. And so it took thousands of years to get from hunter-gatherer to farming, hundreds of years to get from farming to receding famine or improved farming, couple of decades to get from stage three to stage four. And stage four is, on the one hand, people moving from the country to the city, lots of other changes, people buying TVs, cars, and the whole food supply changing really rapidly. And in the UK and US and Canada and places like that, these changes happened, well, some of them happened in Britain as long ago as the Industrial Revolution. We were kind of ahead of the game. It's not a very good game to be ahead of, but we've eaten bad food for a long time <laughs> in England. <Yay. laughs> um, but in other countries, such as Brazil and Mexico, these changes have just, they're happening now. People are living through them in the space of a decade. And Barry Popkin can identify, and this Barry is when Popkin the diet... And identify, this is when it changed. Yeah. And what you see happening quite clearly, you know, we don't want to... <sighs> As everyone keeps saying, obesity, diet-related ill health, it's complex. It's got this huge socioeconomic story. Um, however, the part that isn't really complex is that you can see the food industry comes in. For the first time, people have ultra-processed foods, foods high in sugar, fat, and salt. Um, and suddenly, you see this diet-related ill health on a scale that's never been seen before. And in China, you can see that happening in the space of a decade. In Brazil, yeah, between 2000 and today. Hmm. Just so there's a sweet spot where people are not facing the threat of hunger. They have access to food, but then very quickly. And is it in industry that then steps into that space where people are, you know, it's, it's partly an income increase. People's lives are getting more comfortable. Women's lives are getting more comfortable and that they don't have to make stuff from scratch. Um, and then the industry steps in and goes, we've got you here, you know, happy days, welcome, yeah. to, welcome to the golden age. Um. Exactly. There are a few things that happen at once. I mean, so, so the food culture changes. So the great question that gets begged by this, is, you, I don't want to turn my back on modernity. I mean, I say somewhere in the book, and I fervently believe this, I don't want to go back to a life before Spotify. <laughs> never mind a life before an electric oven. Never mind, you know, I don't want to wash my clothes with a mangle, and I really don't want to be a hunter-gatherer. I, you know, I would like to Or do, a farmer, I, I don't want or to Or a farmer. farmer. Yeah. I would love to yeah. gather blackberries in the autumn. I would yes. love to be shown by a mushroom hunter. Yes. <gasps> wow, it's so delicious. Like, yeah. the few times I've actually gone and gathered chanterelles, best yeah. thing in the world. We should all forage more if we could, if we had time, if we knew how. Mm -hmm. um, but that's, for most people today, that's not an entire way of life. So that the question has to be, can we have all of this wonderful comfort and convenience and women's lives getting easier of modernity without bad food and children who are having all of their teeth extracted by the age of two, which is, there's no upside to that. And whose responsibility? And, Sorry. Yeah, well, what I was going to mm. say is, I mean, South Korea, which you've already mentioned, mm. th there are these little glimmers of hope that it can be done. Mm -hmm. Sorry, you were going to say. Whose responsibility is it to protect us from, in a way, protect us from ourselves, from our own behaviour, because obviously we're the people who are eating these foods, but also protect us from the, the vast industries who are putting that food in our face at every turn and at every point in our lives, either advertising it or... Is it... Is it top-down? Is it government responsibility to regulate those industries, to charge them for the health costs of the food that they're selling? Uh, you know, where does, that, yes. where does that go? Yes, in a way. Yes. Yes. <laughs> I mean, there is shared responsibility, but I think the way that we've talked about the problem has been almost always exactly wrong, which is we speak so much about individual willpower, better choices, but none of us asked for the choices that we're being offered in the shops. Yes. I mean, they're crazy choices on sale in the market in the US, and I imagine it's pretty similar in Ireland and the UK, um, there are now 4,000 different varieties of snack bar, you know, things like protein bar, which is basically just nuts stuck together with sugar that's calling itself something healthy. Um, you know, it's a glorified, expensive cookie. It's not even a delicious cookie, is it? No, it's so terrible. Um, there are 4,000 different varieties of those and only one type of banana, and it's not even a good banana. And then it's also debatable whether in countries like Ireland or the UK should we be eating bananas when we've got 
wonderful local apples that people don't know enough about. There's something mad and wrong there. And as individuals, we can't just go into the shop and say, I want much more delicious bananas. Can you please give them to me? Yeah. Because who do we say that to, Mr. Tesco? Like, yes. where, <laughs> where do we exercise our rebellion? People often write about ethical shopping and ethical consumerism. Um, and this term annoys me. I do feel that we've got a big difference to make mm -hmm. as individuals. And any time, if we're in a privileged position where we have enough money that we could spend more on food and we can support free-range meat and local farmers, of course we should do that. Most people spend a pitifully small percentage of their income on food. But have, what if you're a low-income consumer? Mm -hmm. How is it ethical to say that you should be spending money that you can't afford, buying yes. something you can't afford, which you don't even have the choice of buying yes. in the particular shop that you're dragging your children around? It is the trap that we're in, isn't it? The availability of cheap calories, um, which has obviously been, I mean, I was reading recently uh, uh, Norman Borlaug, the, uh, mm. he won the Nobel Peace Prize the year that I was born, 1970. He was the father of the Green Revolution, mm. um, which combined um, breeding of plants with fertilizers, mm. a dwarf form of wheat that they could put a lot of fertilizer on because the other f uh, forms of wheat, they were very tall and if they were fertilized, they just mm. fell over. Um, and his work saved the lives of millions of people. He's, he averted famine. It's been, yeah, it's been said that a billion people alive today wouldn't be alive without Norman Borlaug. Well, yeah. But, but then other critical voices in agriculture, such as the chef and activist Anne Barber, will say there's another way to grow wheat that would have been better. I mean, this is, I mean it's interesting you've brought up this subject of the Green Revolution, because you were asking who's responsible. And I think so often when people talk about reforming the food supply, there is instantly this outcry about nanny state, isn't yes. there? Like, so when Mayor Bloomberg wanted to reduce the, the, the minimum size of... Cup size in the... Yeah, the, yeah, that you couldn't buy a soda that was any bigger than... A bucket of sugar. It was still a, it was still yeah. a bucket, wasn't yeah. it? It was just a slightly smaller bucket. <laughs> yeah. And the outcry at this proposal that he was invading people's personal freedom Astonishing, and you it's get a very American idea of personal freedom, though it is. It's but here you get the same rhetoric. You get, I mean, you get Boris Johnson talking about sin taxes. Mm -hmm. You get, and it's to me, it's really historically illiterate nonsense um, because the food supply we have now is the result of nanny statism. Yes, it was every government in the world after the Second World War looking around and thinking we must never ever allow our population to go hungry again. Mm -hmm quite understandably, quite rightly. Mm -hmm. But nitrogen that had been used to make bombs gets diverted into nitrogen fertiliser. And suddenly, with good and intentions... And tanks are turned into yes, combined harvesters, as exactly. you say. In your, yeah. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. And you have this system which wasn't the intended result, which is a huge oversupply of cheap wheat and cheap sugar, which may give us calories, but doesn't actually feed us. Mm -hmm. And that was the product of nanny statism. I mean, if you look at the foods that have been subsidised in the UK, huge subsidies given out to the sugar companies. Mm -hmm. Why was that a good idea? Why not subsidise green vegetables? Yeah, and the corn, which then became a sugar. I mean, how yes. do you look at a product like corn and say, oh, yes, that makes The corn, corn which then became it. sugar, the corn, which then became animal feed. And if you look at the world's calories, I, I, another interesting guy I interviewed for the book, there was a lovely young biodiversity expert in Colorado called Colin Khoury. And it's just amazing. There are people in the world, it's very, very hard to measure what anyone eats. Almost impossible. Mm -hmm. Because we all, one way to ask, find out what people eat is to ask people, you know, surveys, but we all lie about yeah, food. I didn't have that tin of Pringles exactly. last night in front of Netflix. Or we or forget. Any, yeah. We forget the Pringles. They're easily forgotten. <laughs> they are. You know. They're not very satisfying. <laughs> no. um, you can't stop eating them. But then surveys, if you don't do surveys, the only other way really is kind of, well, there's one other way which I might come to, but there's, there's market data. Most of what I have in my book is based on market data. Yeah. So what we're buying is what so we're So what we're eating. buying. Yeah. And it's not perfect because we know that... You know, if you are anything like me, sometimes you buy that packet of green beans and then they go into the salad 
compartment. compartment and yes it goes slimy i mean yeah. that happens a lot with salad leaves doesn't it yes <laughs> yeah in fact I, you had a great description of kimchi saying that in one of your restaurant reviews you said that oh yes the bottom of the bag yes you <laughs> said that kimchi um, this korean fermented cabbage reminded you of yeah. salad leaves at the bottom of the bag exactly so we've all yeah. had those <laughs> as much as we want to avoid food waste we have those salad leaves at the bottom of the bag however market data tells us something so colin curry is part of a team of people at the Food and Agriculture as an organisation. They have gathered, it's an amazing, amazing database from 1961 to the present day. Every country in the world that they could find data for, how has the food supply changed? And what you find is simultaneously this narrowing down and this opening up of the diet. So if you are in a country like Vietnam, let's say, there's been an opening up, which is fantastic. Mm -hmm. um, countries which were perilously dependent on a single crop, usually rice, mm -hmm. have now diversified, so they're not putting all of their eggs into one basket. Mm -hmm. That's part of the happy story. But if you look at countries, almost every... I, I was going to say countries like the UK, like our, there is really no... Just let's just say developed countries, which is almost everywhere now, mm -hmm. developed or developing countries. Half of all the calories in the world for the average person come from just six sources. And it's, okay, the first of those sources is animal products. So you could say that's actually many different sources. Diverse. But then it, I think it goes wheat, rice, corn, sugar, soybeans. And the soybean one, this was a surprise to me. So I, when I began this book, I had lots of conversations with people about what substance has probably gone up the most in the world over the past 50 years. Everyone said sugar. Mm -hmm. And it's not even close. It's soybean oil. It's, and people never talk about eating too much soybean oil. People mm. never wake up and say, I feel really hungry for soybean oil. <laughs> That's what I'm hankering for. If only I had some really delicious soybean oil in the house, then I could satisfy my hunger. No. And it's because it's hidden from us. The soybean oil and the sugar and the wheat and the corn and the rice are all processed into these ultra-processed products. So they become unrecognisable as extruded breakfast flakes. And the fluffy t bliss point tastes that are actually engineered to make us want to eat them and not feel full when we're eating them. That, I mean, that, that ultra-processed food, it's a term that's coined, you were, you were saying you were talking recently to the man who coined that, yes, that term. Yes, I'm writing an article about it at the moment and I've just interviewed this man, Carlos Monteiro in Brazil, who coined the term. And he's really changing the whole field of nutrition because people used to just talk about nutrition in terms of is fat bad or is sugar bad? And there are these, still these wars going on between the low carb people and the mm. low sugar people. And again, I feel like a child of divorce and I just want them to stop shouting at each other. <laughs> and waving um, money at yes, each other. Which, and yeah. waving money at each other because that's another part of the story. The extent to which the messages we're given about food are in fact covert lobbying by the food industry of one side or the other. Mm -hmm. But Carlos Monteiro, um, 10 years ago, wrote a groundbreaking paper saying the issue isn't really fat, nor is it sugar, it's ultra processing. And what ultra, pro sorry, I'm going to keep going through these four, it's always seems to be four <laughs> things. He has four categories again. But um, if, if there is any food that exemplifies stage four, it's ultra processed. So around half of what people consume in Ireland, UK, US is now ultra processed. What is ultra processed food? Well, there are, think of four categories of food. Category one is unprocessed. When he first came out with it, he said unprocessed. And then lots of pedants pointed out, well, are you saying that a pint of pasteurized milk is... Is unprocessed, yeah. yes. So then he started calling it unprocessed or minimally processed. Mm -hmm. So that would include anything from fresh fruit, dried fruit, fresh vegetables, dried vegetables, um, you know, a lamb chop, that is unprocessed, mm -hmm. um, an olive, mm -hmm. um, something that you can recognise, you can name it. Yeah. it it's, it's a clearly, single ingredient. It's a single item, ingredient, basically. exactly. Yeah. And it yeah. might have been pasteurised and it might yeah. have gone through practically anything that reaches our shops has been processed in some form. Yes. But it's, you can still absolutely see what it is. Mm -hmm. Category two is culinary ingredients. Things like sugar, oil, flour, butter. Mm -hmm. The really interesting thing that he noticed, this fits with my story about sugar not being the only problem. He noticed that in Brazil, consumption of those products had just gone down. 
And the reason is clearly that people weren't cooking as much. Mm -hmm. But it's kind of weird that you, we kind of agonise about not eating too much sugar to the extent that we don't want to buy a bag of sugar. It somehow feels bad to mm. us. It feels a little bit taboo to have on too our visible. kitchen. Yeah. Too visible. Yeah. And yet, those hidden sugars in the protein bars and all the rest. And the savoury foods, which have enormous And the savoury foods, exactly. The pizza yeah. that has sugar in. Yeah. So, sorry, category one, not processed or minimally processed. Category two, culinary ingredients, which, as he points out, if you're using one and two together, you never use that much of two, do you? I mean, OK, actually, with butter, I am capable <laughs> <laughs> quite a lot. But, you know, it's... It's good. It's and category good. two... Good he rightly points out, is joy. Mm -hmm. Category two, you, you have your lovely green vegetables from category one and you add that pat of butter or that drizzle of olive oil and that pinch of salt mm -hmm. and it becomes something you really want to eat. So that category two with category one, that's pretty good. Yeah. Most people would it agree. It carries the good nutrients into that your system in a, in a nice way. Category yeah. three is processed foods. So that would mean anything from cheese, bread, charcuterie, canned tuna, mm -hmm. canned tomatoes, a tin of chickpeas. Um, category four, completely new variety of food which no one before the 20th century ever ate in their lives, mm -hmm. ultra-processed. And what ultra-processed foods are, as he points out, they're mainly confections of category two. So they are mainly sugar, oil, flour, but you can't just eat soybean oil by itself. Mm -hmm. I mean, people that know about soybean oil in the industry say it's disgusting. It has a slightly fishy aroma. It takes on these hay-like qualities. It doesn't have a nice mouth feel. The only way you can get category two foods to taste good without very much of category one is loads of additives. Mm -hmm. So it's sort of these illusory foods like the tub of Pringles, mm -hmm. which seem to be gesturing at something real and savoury and wholesome, mm -hmm. but they're kind of not. And that's where we're at. And that's where we're at. That's <laughs> because, and it's very controversial. I know I've written about this. There was a big study coming from Carlos about the ultra-processed and the, you know, the shopping basket and how much of it is ultra-processed ingredients. And as a journalist, you suddenly get these emails from the bread lobby saying, excuse me, um, uh, you know, sliced pan is not ultra-processed and we'll tell you why and please come and we'll educate you about bread. Um, so, you know, the the industry, because a lot of these foods, you know, you think, how many 4,000 bars? Yes. Um, and the market is healthy. That sounds vast, but yeah. then when you look behind who, who, these, who the companies are, it's again a small number, it's a small very, number small of very number powerful of players, isn't it? countries yes. with, you know, the, the kind of GDP of a small country is their turnover, their global turnover, which They're gives... these huge multinational companies. So as a journalist, how do you trust the science now? Or... Do you have to find yourself looking behind the science to see who's funding this research? And I did have to find myself repeatedly filtering out voices that I'd considered to be authorities. And then I dug a bit deeper and I thought, why are you promoting that message so vociferously? And then I followed the money a little bit and thought, OK, no, I'm not trusting you anymore. Yeah. And that happened a few times. Yeah. And I felt I was going in with my eyes wide open. So who knows how hard it is just for an ordinary consumer with all of these competing messages and out there. Is there a stage five where, you know, that... There has to be. There has to be, <laughs> there has to be a stage five. There has to be a stage five. So stage five, I mean, Popkin talks about stage five. And I think it's quite clear that there are glimmers of stage five going on all around us. Um, so he calls, he has various different names for stage five. He sometimes calls it behaviour change. But in stage five, you'd have... All of the good things that have happened in stage four, the comfort, the cities, the women not necessarily being the ones solely burdened with creating food. Um, but at the same time, you wouldn't have people being sickened by their own food. And you'd have cities designed that it's easier for people to take exercise and walk, and you'd have water becoming the default drink. Like, I was staggered. This is, again, from Popkin, but 500 calories a day in America come just from drinks. So if you just took that out, you'd be kind of be backed out. You could change nothing about how you eat. Yeah. Just take those calories away. Get and your you'd, calories from water. And, and you'd be fine. Yeah. Or water or, or, or tea or black coffee or I don't know. I mean, it's, I'm constantly in this battle between black coffee and then other drinks are nice too, aren't they? Yeah. <laughs> you don't want to close yourself off to all of the delicious possibilities the world has to offer. But 
Yeah. And that's also a feature of if we're in a proto stage five stage, there's, there, there's a large and a lot of social media driven of eliminating things from your diet mm. in order to be clean in your eating. And I know you've written very um, interestingly about that and where, you know, that, 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 that's a dangerous, also a dangerous idea. Clean eating, I mean, it makes total sense to me. To me, clean eating is a dysfunctional response to a still more dysfunctional food supply. So it, it makes total sense to me that given that we're in this world where so many people are being sickened by the food in the shops, we can't anymore trust the food in the shops to nourish us in the way that we could in the past, that people would think, okay, I'm just going to cut everything out more or less and just subsist on organic vegetables. Mm -hmm. But that clearly isn't a healthy way to live. And it's really upsetting because they are spreading these quite dogmatic, zealous messages through social media. And it's, there is an epidemic of mental health problems mm -hmm. among young people, not just girls. You know, anorexia is affecting a lot of mm. young boys now too. So that's, that's a danger. You don't ever want to be... That's, when I first heard about the ultra-processed concept, um, I worried about it, thinking, is it somehow moralising food? But I think... I feel like there should be a better word than ultra-processed. It doesn't really trip off the tongue, does it? No. <laughs> I don't know if... I, crap food? We well, call it crap? but then that is moral as well, yes, isn't it? Yes. It needs to And you be... get very judgy very quickly in this arena, exactly. don't you? I mean, and that's the last thing you want to do. Montero admitted to me yesterday over the phone, because I think he's a little bit too hardline in saying... So he and his guidelines just says, avoid ultra-processed food. Well... Good luck with that yeah. if you're shopping at an average supermarket. Yeah. Or you have a child who's hungry. And, or you have a child who's yeah. hungry. It would mean, as you've just said, you couldn't buy any bread yeah. for sale in the supermarket. I think that's too extreme. But if we're saying we're now at 50% on average, I said to him, well, would it be a good thing if we could get down to 10%? And he said, oh, yes, that'd be wonderful. Yes. So I think we should be talking about ratios rather than yeah. absolutes. But getting back to your... So the glimmers of stage five, South Korea is a glimmer. And your question about who is responsible. Um, South Korea, as they went through their stage of economic development, they continued to recognise governmentally that food was important, that nutrition was important. Mm. So they went through one of the most rapid periods of economic change of any country in the world, even more rapid than China. Their GDP increased, I think it was 17-fold between the 1960s and the 1990s. Oh. And yet, during that same period, they actually started eating more vegetables, which is amazing. It's like, how can we all be South <laughs> Korea? And there's a few different reasons. One is culture. Coming back to this thing that you think tastes like the slimy, disgusting vegetables at the bottom. <laughs> kimchi. <laughs> Who in this room has ever eaten or likes kimchi? Yay. Yay. I do kind of like it. I love kimchi, <laughs> but I, I didn't love it the first time. Yeah, yeah, it's and this amazes it's me. I mean, this is a sign of how Irish food culture is changing. I did this a talk about my book two weeks ago in um, Marlborough, and I was amazed, hands shooting up with love for kimchi. Yeah. I don't think we would have all said we love kimchi <laughs> even 10 years ago. I remember people saying, What's kimchi? It's yeah. rotten cabbage. That doesn't sound very nice. <laughs> it's, I mean, it's actually, for anyone that is uninitiated to kimchi, it's a Korean pickle that's almost like a staple food. Um, you take some cabbage or another brassica. They have many, many different types of green vegetables. You massage it in salt. Um, you add some of that kind of radish called muli. There's garlic in there. There's chilli. There's various other pungent aromatics. And then you just leave it to ferment. Mm -hmm. And people in Korea will have that. Any meal that they're having, breakfast, lunch or dinner, kimchi is on the table. So that's reason number one. If we view... We love, it's a love that it's comes love from thing. childhood. That that's it's, your home, that's your taste of home almost. Exactly. So, yeah. If fermented cabbage were as delicious to you as chocolate... Mm then food would be a different... We're in the golden age, finally. We're <laughs> yes, getting to the golden age. that's the age. golden age. That's stage one. But the second thing is that the government saw it was important. So as they were going through this economic change, the government put on free cooking workshops so that people would know how to make the traditional dishes. They put commercials on TV saying support local farming, support organic farming. Mm -hmm. I mean, the idea that a government would do that here, I mm -hmm. think, is just... And why, why are governments in the West so resistant to that idea? Because, you know, we do look to authority for guidance, you know, and we fi we're finding our food authorities in all kinds of different arenas now. But, but, you know, there was a time. I mean, we had a, just mentioning recently the plastic bag 
ban in Ireland, which I'm not sure could happen now. There's a sense of politicians not wanting to tell people what to do anymore, or you know, officials, maybe, maybe, maybe not politicians, but officials in state roles. I think they're terrified of treading on the toes of the food industry, which is bizarre because government has way more power than it thinks it does. Yeah. And the food industry only has all of that power because government has allowed it to have all that power. A couple of weekends ago, I was in Abergavenny and I met a really interesting farmer whose dad had been the first person in the UK to do battery chickens. Mm -hmm. And he said, well, they started off doing this thing. They couldn't believe they had 7,000 to a shed and it seemed kind of disgusting to them that they were making good money. And then it went up from 7,000 to 10,000 and from 10,000. And all the way along, he said his dad kept thinking, well, when's somebody going to stop me doing this? Mm. Because they and the family could see it was wrong mm -hmm. and it was horrible and that the chickens were getting debased. Mm. And the man who, he now runs a really good organic farm in Wales and he was saying anyone that's been in one of those sheds would never want to eat a piece of chicken. Yeah, and or yet, smelt one of those sheds. Yeah, yeah. and yet it, it's the world's most popular form of protein. And I think, I think people in government, they're, you're right, they're, they're scared of offending us as consumers that we'll shout nanny state mm -hmm. at them. Mm -hmm. Um, and they're terrified of the food industry. But in, in Britain, we've had this problem that it goes back at least to the 19th century of just being so laissez-faire about food, of just mm. thinking, well, if people are making money out of it, we can't interfere in that. Mm -hmm. And that even happened um, with Theresa May and the child obesity strategy. I and mean, that was meant to be the first move that her government was meant to do to finally implement this radical child obesity strategy. Mm. And then instead, the very first thing she did was to water it down, saying we mustn't damage industry profits. Yes. And you think it's so short-sighted yes. not there to seems see to be a... that to invest in this thing which gives us health and well-being is to invest in the future. There seems to be a sort of a politician's first thought is how will business take this, as mm. opposed to my responsibilities to people. Mm. Um, there's a wonderful book, Winners Take All, looking at mm. uh, an American journalist who... <coughs> Uh, interviewed Bill Clinton um, and talked about this kind of idea of yeah. scaling back, I think it was sugary drinks in, in school vending machines. Mm -hmm. And Bill Clinton, who we all see as a progressive politician, mm -hmm. his first response was, well, we, we have to factor in the industry um, a position on that. Um, and he was, he said it was a light bulb moment about how the, the world works now, that that's the first consideration. Mm. Um, and it's up to us as people and voters and consumers to, to probably turn that around. Coming back to our own kitchens and back to that, you know, you being a snoop in the kitchen and what to do. Your last chapter, um, I think it's headed um, old plates, new food. So mm. wh why should we be using old plates? What are, what are old plates good for? They're smaller. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, that's a very simple answer. I, I suddenly, it was just brought home to me in a really simple way at home because... Um, I inherited a lot of plates from my granny when she died because um, no one else in the family wanted them and I just loved them. And um, when we got married a long time ago, we had a different set of plates, which were these kind of giant white habitat plates that everyone yeah. ate off in the 1990s. And then now dinner plates are even bigger than that. So most of the time we were eating off these giant white plates. And then suddenly I just realised I loved my granny's plates. Why and I noticed that the same portion of pasta, which would look measly and tiny on the white plates, um, suddenly looked really generous on my <laughs> granny's plates. So why old plates? Number one, they're smaller. Number two, I feel that ceramics and reusable you know, things to eat off in general are the great underrated technology. I mean, I, it makes me so happy that some people are going back to glass mm -hmm. milk bottles. Mm -hmm. Like it has felt like it tastes lovely out of a glass milk it bottle. It tastes Again, lovely. It yes. looks lovely. Yeah. It is lovely. Yeah. It can be rewashed and reused multiple, yeah. multiple times. And there's that muscle memory of pressing the foil down exactly. with your thumb not too far. And, you know, that's the stuff yeah, of the Yeah, it is. No, and no. I, I did it recently. Unfortunately, the, the farmer who was supplying the milk had a row with the <laughs> inspector, health inspector, and is now, you know, having to build some 3,000 euro shed in, in order to be able to supply the milk. So mm. my milk bottles are gone. But oh no, and it's hard, and it does again. cost more, and it's so, it's, yeah. it, it's not available. And I kept forgetting to bring the empties back, yeah. and oh, you, no, know, it, stuff, you know, yes. but that's, it's not perfect, but new food on all plates. I mean, I feel we don't go back, there isn't a golden age. I feel so much of what's happened with food, I mean, we were just talking over this fantastic lunch at Kai, 
one of the most delicious. I'm just thinking about that soda bread and that butter and that just ate the most delicious plate of crab. It's gorgeous. That beautiful plate of food wouldn't have existed quite in that form with that freedom of seasoning. Yeah. Wouldn't have existed 20 years ago. Yeah. I don't think it would have existed 10 years ago. I don't want to go back to some era before we're all excited about kimchi. Yes. Um, so there's the dazzle, which we're enjoying, and there's the dismal at the other end. Exactly. And if we can bring them If we could somehow closer bring together. them closer together, yeah. then that seems like a happy medium. And I think there are signs that consumers are doing this. We know that in the States, sales of packaged goods have been falling by a percentage point year on year, and sales of raw ingredients, you know, fresh herbs, fresh vegetables, mm. are creeping up, or mm. even allowing for us sometimes forgetting to cook things mm. <laughs> at the back of the salad crisper. You don't buy fresh herbs unless you're intending to cook, do you? Mm -hmm. I mean, that's a sign of something. Yeah. Um, we know that consumption of sweetened sodas is just beginning to plateau. The food industry is scared. They should be scared. Yeah. Because at the point that we all notice this giant lie, at the point we all notice, I mean, the things that made me angry, um, things like the fact that in the remotest villages of the Amazon, Nestle are now sending door-to-door -door salespeople, knocking on people's doors, saying to poor consumers, would you like to buy this packet of chocolate cereal? It's vitamin fortified, it's good for your children. And it's evil. This, yeah. We should name it yeah. as evil. Yeah. We should let's, actually, get, let's get judgy on, about yes, that. We can be very, yeah. very judgy about yeah. that. So yeah. my thing is never, never yeah. judge an individual eater mm -hmm. for what they're eating. Mm -hmm. Don't tell someone they should feel guilty because of the size of their body, yeah. which is mostly just a response to the fact that we live in a food supply that supplies us all with loads of stuff all of the yeah. time. Yeah. But do judge those food companies who think it's okay to lie to people mm -hmm and sell them foods that they know are going to sicken them. I think that nutrition giant lie on the size of cereal packets are, it's one of the things that really gets my goat. Mm. And I'm not sure why it's allowed to be said, you know, and you've got the follow on milk, baby milk stuff happening as well, which is, I mean, Irish agriculture is built mm. around trying to push uh, baby milk into China. Um, you know, there are very, disturbing practices around telling people what's healthy and Very being disturbing. allowed to tell people that And it doesn't healthy. have to be allowed. So another glimmer is Chile. The government, there's lots of exciting stuff going on in South America, partly because they suffered the worst effects of the nutrition transition so quickly. So paediatricians there are just seeing this is really wrong that children's health is suffering so quickly. Um, but a really visionary paediatrician just kept lobbying and lobbying and lobbying the government until eventually they produced the most radical food laws the world has ever seen. And they've taken the cartoon characters off the box of cereal. Which is amazing, because you think, yes, why should they be allowed to have that cute tiger and that yeah. lovely monkey making you think that this isn't just a packet of sugar-coated, nutritionless flakes? Mm -hmm. I mean, just imagine, you, you'd still be perfectly free to buy it mm -hmm. in plain packaging, like <laughs> cigarettes. If you want to buy that for your child, go ahead. Mm -hmm but without all of the illusions. Yeah. I mean, there are illusions and, and silos. We were just talking as well about the silos that there are around food now that you have, you know, you have to be in one camp or the other. You have to be entirely vegan or, you know, just eating burgers, with, you know, pieces with mm. burgers in the rim. Or, you know, there's, there's this kind of vehemence around it. Mm. Um, and you walk into this maelstrom of... Uh, rage and love you know yes. when you're when you're writing about food is that is that getting more intense do you think i think it's getting more intense and i and is that because the stakes are high and people are realizing i i've only recently realized how much of that intensity especially on social media is being fueled covertly by the food industry themselves mm -hmm. i mean there's this phrase i'm not vegan myself i'm very far from being vegan However, I think the birth of modern vegetarianism among young people is something to be encouraged by because it's people who are questioning the food supplier, trying to eat in a more thoughtful way. Mm. Um, it's, yes, it sometimes goes along with a bit of sanctimoniousness and mm. sometimes it segues into this thing, clean eating. <laughs> but I mean, I, I really think of and all the things... The, you know, the idea of, of putting your vegan thing on Instagram, but also I, I looked at the figures in January because we had a huge, you know, the Eat Lancet study was uh, published 
there was this huge pushback from the idea that we were telling people not to eat meat anymore and everybody seemed to be vegan on social media. Well, see, so that's such a good example. So the Eat Lancet report came out and it was instantly attacked as being written by angry vegans. Yeah. And I almost just thought, oh dear, this report written by angry vegans, that doesn't sound very good. And then I read the report and it wasn't saying that at all. No, it was sorry. saying that in many parts of the world, populations would benefit from eating more meat. Mm -hmm. Breastfeeding women in poor countries should have meat, eggs, milk, mm -hmm. as much as they, you know, they have desperate deficit of protein. It was saying um, that even in the West, you could have some meat, you could have some... It, it was very, very different from the way it was depicted. It was very much saying, this is the number of people we're projected to have, these are the resources, yes. here's how we can share it out mm. so that everybody has a healthy diet. Yes. But it became a, I'm only allowed to have one rasher a month kind of yes. thing. Certainly in, in Ireland, um, it was... It made people furious. By, it, absolutely furious. And obviously the main people it made furious was the meat industry. Um, but then you get the sense that, you know, are people who get furious, and I mean, obviously we all get furious very easily these days. <laughs> We're all <laughs> just on edge, don't we? I feel of, that. love and rage. Do we, you know, do, are, are our buttons being pressed by yes. people that we don't know? Our buttons are definitely being pressed. I really know All the more reason we need all of <laughs> this. <laughs> yeah, so I feel, yeah, there were definitely the kind of high carbohydrate people. So, so when you see these messages of people saying, we mustn't demonise processed food. Well, some people might say that. I, I don't really believe in demonising food, but I think it is OK, as I've said, to demonise Nestle going door to door in the Amazonian village. Or to just say that that is what is happening. Yes. yes. I'm, happy yeah. to de I'm actually happy to go further. I'm happy to demonise yeah. that. <laughs> yeah. I'm happy to outright condemn it. You know, they're pushing. Yeah. They're like drug pushers at that point. <laughs> I'm happy to demonise the thing when you go into WH Smith and you try to buy a newspaper and they say, do you want this family-sized bar of chocolate? Yeah. And as a former compulsive eater, that one really gets me because I think I'm so lucky now. I genuinely don't want that. But there was a time when I would have kind of been so hard trying to say no to the family size bar of yeah. chocolate, but when it's practically given to you... Yes, as that, part of the service. I think we're allowed to demonise that. Yeah. So there's people saying, we mustn't demonise this. Well, maybe some of them are just reasonable people who don't like demonising stuff. A lot of them are working for the breakfast cereal industry. Yes. It's now so become their, their very Their salaries obvious. are coming from the thing that you're trying to demonise. Yes. Yeah. You write very powerfully about your own relationship to food. Mm. Um, is that something that you kind of you felt self-conscious about? You mean, did you did you struggle with that that idea of putting it into your books? Because you've written about it from mm. the last certainly the last three of your books. I did I've struggle. Read. The last two, I I started writing about it in my previous book, First Bite, which is about the psychology of eating and how we establish our food habits from mm. childhood onwards. And that one changed. Like this one, sort of almost became less personal in a way. It started with a little shopping list, and then it grew. With first bite, I thought, I just really want to know what the science is on you know, why are two different babies in the family so different in their approaches to food? And, mm -hmm. and I have three kids and I'm not going to embarrass them. Well, I have probably already embarrassed them, two of them at the back. They all eat in a very different way. Um, and I, that interested me and I wanted to know. So I really started that book in quite an abstract way, almost just thinking I want to. And then I thought, I can't write about this subject in an honest way without putting myself there. And it just all of these memories came flooding back because I did, as a teenager, have a really unhappy relationship with food. My sister was anorexic. I overate to compensate. I think I was always the greedy one in the family. I always loved being... In the, you know, I often say there were lots of payoffs to being a compulsive eater. You know, the, the food itself, mm. <laughs> it's just great. <laughs> um, but I looked back to a point when food had been almost like a pathology for me. And then it wasn't. And I felt this kind of surge of gratitude when I was writing that book, thinking, I'm so lucky. I've somehow come through the other side. And to me, the biggest thing, I think so much of the nonsense we talk about food is mixed up with the idea of sort of swimsuit bodies or, you know, this Instagram, you parade your green juice and you parade your amazing figure. Abs, yeah. And that's nonsense to me. To me, that and other people I've spoken to who also changed their relationship with food, whichever angle you've come at it from, you know, recovering anorexics have had to go in a different direction. But it's the same thing. It's switching off an angry voice inside your head. Mm. I used to have this horrible voice berating me about food and telling me I, I lived in the era of 
low fat. So mm. it would be like I couldn't eat a piece of cheese or mm. butter, which to me is like nectar suddenly became something that was to be rationed, which is a sad way to live. Um, and I knew I'd change when the angry voice got switched off. And I felt so grateful. So that, that last book partly came knowing that human beings can change the way they eat. They can change their relationship with food. That's the wonderful, happy, optimistic story here. And what switched off the angry voice? How did... How I did think... Oh, so I, now I'm going to embarrass my husband too. So I, <laughs> when I give versions of these talk, not in front of my husband, I say, I fell in love. <laughs> and, then, oh. and then I had this really nice woman coming up to me when I was talking about it in San Francisco saying, do I have to fall in love? <laughs> no, you don't. It's okay. Slicking through Tinder. <laughs> Fine, help me. <laughs> but I suppose what I mean is, you know, we've been talking throughout this You time. fell in love with yourself, to be like yeah, California. Exactly. Yeah. I got in a much happier state, generally. I think it's always important to remember that anything we eat doesn't happen in isolation, does it? Mm -hmm. This epidemic we're talking about, diet-related ill health, is also an epidemic of depression. People mm. are stressed out. People are... Suffering. Mm. That was. I remember kind of just almost stopping reading and reading it again. That that part in the book where you talk about the Japanese men living in San Francisco mm. and their study. Tell me, tell me about that because that directly feeds into that idea of happiness and me, and mental health as well as physical health yeah. tied into food. I found this such an interesting study. So this one was led by someone called Michael Marmot, and in 1969, 1970, he studied. Um, Japanese American men who'd moved to the Bay Area of San Francisco and he wanted to study heart disease. He noticed that um, Japanese American men in general had much lower incidence of heart disease than white American men. Um, but he noticed that even across the cohort of Japanese Americans, there were wide variables. You know, some of them were still suffering almost American levels of heart disease, and others seemed to be immune. And he did such an interesting study, which is that he did surveys to set up, not the differences, he also did a separate survey on what they ate, but to set up not what they ate, but how they ate. So he asked some questions about the extent to which they were still leading a kind of Japanese way of life, even in California. And it turned out that that was the key determining factor in whether they were at risk of heart disease. So he found across the group, many of the Japanese American men were still eating Japanese food. But let's say half of them were eating that Japanese food in a hurry, with a sense that there was no time to sit down, in an American style way. The other half were eating surrounded by their family, they were making time for dinner, they were um, eating with something somewhat communal still, it had rituals around it, and that was the thing that made the difference. And I, that's such an interesting study because it shows how far wrong, I don't know, almost every culture in the world is going, mm. except for perhaps Spain and Italy where they still have lovely long lunch hours. And the um, ingredient that they're including in their eating is time. It's time. Yeah. And, but I think the time is something even bigger than that, because what is time, really? <coughs> it's something that we spend on things that we believe matter, like Twitter and online shopping. You know, that's, <laughs> that's what we think matters now, and we think email matters more than food. We've got a really mm. skewed sense of priorities. Mm. You had that, you spoke Catherine. to a... An, Catherine, we have a, this is fantastic. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> we, it's an old day, but it's after 3.30, so could we go to the audience? Of course, I'm yes. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, yes. We have a, a mic. Do we have a mic? How long do we have, Katrina? Take 15 minutes. 15 minutes. Okay, great. Hi. 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 Great talk. Fascinating. Thank you. Um, I've just moved back from Singapore, where I lived for 10 years, and um, to your point, uh, it's really shocking, the difference in cultures for a number of reasons, but one of them, food. As you said, and we all know Singapore is a bit of a nanny state, but the government do, like Korea, have a lot of ads in the cinemas about healthy eating. Um, the culture is all about taking time to eat. But what strikes me the most is that um, the, la well, the lack of government-led information here in Ireland towards parents, and particularly school children, um, about healthy eating. So in Singapore, parents get up early to make lunch for their children if it's not provided in, in schools. <clears throat> excuse me, which it, it, a lot of the time is, but regardless, children will go to school with a hot cooked lunch. Since I've come home, I'm up at 
6.30 in the morning, cooking, you know, a full lunch for my kids to take to school. And I'm sure they feel like, you know, well, they have, it hasn't hit them yet, but they're different. And I just don't understand why, you know, uh, well, there's no school lunches, but why parents aren't, you know, encouraged to send in nutrients for their kids' lunches, why we aren't encouraged to take time, like you said, about long lunches or about, you know, making food, you know, a critical part of the day. Mm. Um, why it's just not, uh, why so many people are so unaware of food and what it's required for, you know, for, to be healthy and to be mentally healthy as well. Mm. So I just, yeah, why is there no pressure on the government to I do think, that? I mean, I think the short answer is because we don't think it's important. It would be, you're working mm. with a school at the moment, this is a new... I am, so, so the... I write one of my heroes, but he's also my colleague now on a new charity called Taste Ed. He's a head teacher called Jason O'Rourke, who has a um, little primary school in Lincolnshire in England. And I think he's an amazing example of if you have somebody in charge of something who thinks food does matter, everything changes. So he's got exactly the same budget as any other English school, but because he thinks food is the most important thing, at his school, he has a heritage apple orchard with 22 different varieties of apple. Every class has its own kitchen garden. They grow their own organic tomatoes. You see the children picking the tomatoes. He gets the three-year-olds in the nursery doing knife skills. Um, <laughs> and it's just because Jason, he believes in food to his bones. Yeah. And that's what happens. If we could have somebody in government that believed in food, everything would change. But I, I think you're completely right. I think it's, it's only when you go somewhere where you see that food is still in the culture that you see what's missing and how mad it is the way we're living that we're just squeezing it out of the day. And I mean, correct me if I'm wrong. I mean, I've interviewed people in Ireland about the school lunch situation here. There's very little time given mm -hmm. to lunch. Is that right? And Seconds. Yeah, my boys come home with full lunch boxes all the time. And, and you can only, time to and there's no school dinners, right? All no, very few. Very few. There is some food to Desh schools. Um, and I live beside a secondary school in, in, in the inner city where they've got this amazing food program in, but it is a huge struggle to, to make it work for all kinds of reasons. It's fascinating. Um, and it, yeah, we, it's not knitted into our Department of Health or our Department of Education in yeah. the way that it needs to be. It's the Department and of it, Agribusiness, uh, basically. It needs to be knitted into both, doesn't it? Because yeah. I think people need to see these figures. I mean, there are studies done showing that um, every 10 minutes that you take off a child's lunch hour limits the possibility of them eating vegetables. I mean, that's based on a canteen rather than a packed lunch, but I imagine it's, it's just somebody's just scarfing something down as quickly yeah. as they can. And, and this nurse that you talked talk to yes. in the book, she had a wonderful... And it's kind of a new lens on the idea of time and food. She described food as being like a pause in music. That's yes, I interviewed someone who'd been a nurse in British hospitals in the 1970s when there was still a subsidised canteen and everyone sat down and the food was a bit overcooked, kind of, you know, shepherd's pie with lashings of gravy, but still it was there and it was very cheap and everyone ate it. And she said that that lunch hour, and then afterwards everyone had a cigarette and then they went back to work. <laughs> But she said it was like a pause in music. She said it was there to, to revive you, to break up the rhythms and to prepare you for what was next. Yeah. And that's, and if children don't need that, I don't know who does. I mean, it's yeah. crazy that we're expecting children to learn in the afternoon not having eaten. I, I completely agree food. with you. Yeah. And it needs to change culturally as well as, I mean, it, you can see what the measures would be, but it takes somebody in charge to say, this matters. This matters every bit as much as literacy and numeracy. Yeah, and fitness. Yes, over here. Um, hello, B and Catherine. A fantastic talk. Um, this is a question and a small advert as well, uh, because I have copies of your book for sale here down the back. I arrived five minutes late. Excellent. But um, congratulations on the book, uh, B. It was one of my favourite non-fiction um, books of the year. Oh, thank you. It's, uh, it's a wonderful read. Um, and everything is backed up. There's 45, 50 pages of uh, notes and references and, and a really comprehensive index as well. Um, but one of the things that I really liked was the epilogue that, that um, Catherine mentioned, um, <clears throat> food, new food, on, on, new food on, on old plates. Um, there's a lot of really simple things that you suggest that we could do, mm. which after reading some of the book, uh, I found that really encouraging. But maybe you could just kind of take us through a few of them now. You, you mentioned about like proper water, mm. about eating, um, 
eating protein and vegetables first, then carbohydrates, mm. and, and, and changing your appetites and taking time for food and all the things, some things that you've mentioned already, but uh, I thought it was a really good way to end the book. Thank you so much. Thank yeah. you. And I wanted B to read uh, that last paragraph. Shall I read? Yeah. End, so. Well, I mean, so, yeah, so I, you've actually run through half of them. I'm going to say find, <laughs> find time for food, <laughs> vary what you eat, try to eat in ratios, not in absolutes. Um, um, shift the balance, change your appetites. I mean, this in a way comes back to my last book, but I just think we so often are fatalistic and think, well, the problem is with me because I'm a chocoholic and that can never change. And just to know you can absolutely change your appetites. That's a much easier way to change than going on a diet, which yep. is impossible, yep. setting yourself up for failure. Um, and the last rule I have, which is the one that I most believe in and which is really what um, I believe in all the more since I've been doing this charity taste ed working in schools, what we do with that charity, Jason, the head teacher and I, is we, you just go into a classroom, offer a child fresh fruits or vegetables, and ask them to use all five of their senses, not just taste, to say what they notice. And they come up with these amazing similes. They'll say things like, um, I don't know, the best one that a child ever said was they looked at a strawberry and they said, the strawberry is like a rocket, and all of the seeds are windows, and the leaves are fire. <laughs> I thought, yes, oh my God. I never saw that before. Should be a food writer. I know, exactly. Yeah. They, they all should be food writers. Yeah. But so, you, so the last bit is you. Do you want me to read? Do. The read, last read bit. Because so, I took this away and I, I've, I've kept it. Sometimes I, I find the older I get, books seem to wash through me, but things stick. And the thing that stuck with me from this book was that idea that I, I, I step away from my keyboard. I work from home. I step away from my keyboard, my phone, and I take my chopping board out and I start chopping an onion. Mm. And I am um, enjoying cooking as meditative escape from all of the whiz bang stuff that's going on the rest you of the time. You feel restored, don't you? We need it yeah. now more than ever, I yeah. think. And, th and that's what this beautiful last oh, part so says. That, yeah. Yeah. So, so this last one is called Use Your Senses. Even on busy days, we can feed our senses with food. Keep small pots of herbs in the kitchen or the garden if you have one. When feeling low, pick a mint leaf, rub it on your hand and inhale deeply. Try to know food with your ears, nose and hands, as well as your mouth. Smell it, touch it and look at it before you taste it. See the way the segments of an orange fall apart. Learn to recognise the difference between fresh and stale garlic, between the sourness of lemons and that of vinegar. Try to relish a range of tastes that go beyond sweetness. Appreciate the bitterness of grapefruit and chicory. Notice the sound a really good piece of toast makes when you crunch it. Smell a stick of cinnamon before you add it to a pot of rice. Feel the ridges on a stick of celery. Come to your senses. I think there was one more question here, the, the gentleman in the middle. Yep. Have we time, Katrina? Yes, yeah, have brilliant. <laughs> Thank you. That, that was fascinating. You, you talked about, um, I suppose, the limited choices that we actually have um, when we come to eat in, in, for most people in modern life. And I suppose, how does, how does the influence of big food, how has it manifested itself in our decisions? Or how, where does the, obviously, there's the availability but also there's the taste creation. Mm. Um, have you looked at that, you know? Uh, how, how are we influenced by big food? Mm. So there's a, if you're interested on purely the taste creation aspect of big food, there's a really good book by someone called Michael Moss called Sugar, Fat, Salt, which talks about the bliss point that they attempt to manufacture. So just that combination of sugar and fat that are going to get people the most hooked. But yes, I do talk about, I mean, there's a structural problem. It isn't just a kind of accidental problem, which is, I mean, I've been talking a lot about the food industry as if I think they're evil. I don't. They're just out to make money. I just think that they need to be encouraged to make money through selling us things that make us well and feed us properly. But the problem at the moment, which is structural, is that the profit margins on selling one of these ultra-processed ingredients, ultra-processed foods made from basically just sugar and soybean oil or whatever it might be, much, much, much higher than just selling us a potato, a carrot, 
a lamb chop, a chickpea. Um, so that is part of what's going on, that they have a vested interest in taking, whether it's an animal product or whether it's wheat, taking it in its very, very cheapest form and then essentially conjuring illusions about it using a range of clever flavourings and colourings and emulsifiers. A lot of people believe that emulsifiers may be one of the key elements in the obesity crisis because they're in almost every ultra-processed food um, and we don't really know what their effects are on the human body. Um, I don't know if that answers it, but good question. Yeah, an awful lot of scientific research goes into making it taste as, as addictive as it does. And that's a controversial word as well. People will come down on you like a ton of bricks if you Quasi-addictive. Quasi -addictive. We have to say quasi-addictive. Quasi-addictive. <laughs> so there was one more question, sorry. Yes. Just there. Um, fascinating uh, conversation, thank you. Uh, you touched on the Green Revolution and the distance we are from um, the soil compared to the past. And... Um, you might have an opinion on the pressure that the food industry and uh, retailers are putting on farmers to intensify their agriculture to squeeze more and more efficiencies out of the soil, which <clears throat> in this country, certainly in the last 40 years, has led to huge degradation of our mm. biodiversity and, and loss of wildlife and the marginalisation of wildlife. Um, have you an opinion on how we can bring the farmers with us on this green revolution to change the way that food is produced in this country? I mean, I, good question. I mean, I just feel we need completely different agricultural policies. We need ones which encourage farmers to do the right thing. Because, I mean, farmers just, just want to produce mm -hmm. beautiful things that people want to eat. Generally, when I've met farmers, that's what they want to do, and they want to make a living out of it. And it's really, really hard to do that because they're rewarded for producing things which are very uniform, which don't necessarily taste good, but the supermarket doesn't care that much about flavour, so that isn't one of the criteria. So if they're going to go off and make something extra flavoursome, that's got to be somehow their own personal passion project. Labour of love. Labour of yeah. love. Yeah. I mean, we need a completely different agricultural system that, as you say, I mean, puts soil and the health of the soil um, at the heart, because healthy soil then feeds through into healthy consumers. And... I don't think that the concept of biodiversity has been part of agricultural policy in any country of the world, really. And perhaps in Japan, mm -hmm. I think in South Korea, maybe. Um, I don't see any signs of it in the UK. I mean, I see lots of people doing fantastic things. Groups like the Soil Association are championing it. People like... I mean, it has to change. I mean, it's... The other cause for optimism, right at the top, people, so the Food and Agriculture Organization have written reports saying, with climate change, agriculture simply cannot be business as usual. Nope. It's going to have to change. But it would be really nice if it could change before we reach the apocalypse. Yeah, it's a huge part of the problem, but it's also, there's also a huge fix in food in that soil can sequester carbon if we're farming in the right ways. There's a wonderful book, uh, called Wilding by Isabella Tree, um, uh, looking at how they, in, in, in a short space of time, again, we're talking short spaces of time, 10 years, they it completely reversed the biodiversity loss on a huge farm in Sussex by letting the land do what it can do naturally. Um, so, uh, but then you come up against the, and again, their industry voices saying, yes, but how do we feed 9 billion people? Um, and part of the answer to that is we stop wasting 40, 30 to 40 percent of the food we're already producing because that's enough for nine billion people. But uh, it gets very difficult to make that argument as an advocate, uh, you know, for food and for farming because the lobby interests, and we've seen the beef farmers trying to protest outside uh, uh, processors. It's a cartel which is enormously powerful, and they can they can pull incredible. Um, you know, resources to face down people who say, I need, a, I need to be paid better for what I'm producing. But paying farmers better for what they're producing is a common ground where everybody wins, mm. apart from the, the very top um, tier who are creaming the profits at the moment. That's my soapbox moment. No, I agree with that. But, yeah. <laughs> but I'm going to let B, I do have a kind of summing up of, are you optimistic? This is, yes. uh, you know, I'm, I'm trying to go between this is incredibly exciting there's amazing opportunities people are talking about all these issues 
Are you optimistic that we're going in a, in a better direction? We're going to get to stage five yes. golden age. I'm always optimistic because there's always another breakfast. <laughs> <laughs> I've ready breakfast. Well, <laughs> Brilliant. Thank you so much, B, and thank you, everybody. Brilliant questions. Great <laughs>As you can see, we could have gone on for another hour. This is just the most wonderful discussion. Was that Charlie Byrne who mentioned books at the back? And Charlie, are you selling them here? Yes. Great. So folks, you can buy Bee's wonderful book, and she will sign it for you at the back of the hall after this. Um, after listening to her describing the sound of biting into a, a piece of toast, I'm now longing for toast, <laughs> slathered in butter, which she described as nectar. Anyway, fantastic ideas, and I want you to thank B and to thank Catherine Cleary, who moderated this uh, discussion so expertly.